Thank you, Bine. And uh, thank you, Jesse, and other organizers for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share some updates on skin cancers. I'm actually going to be mostly focusing on melanoma because of uh, time constraints. And uh, here are my disclosures. And uh, I'm going to start with a case. So uh, I was a slacker, and I did not submit it in time. So we'll do it the old-fashioned way of uh, show of hands uh, for the options here. So this is actually a patient who presented in my clinic a few months back, a 51-year-old man with new-onset left-sided facial twitching. And he also had multiple new subcutaneous nodules. He had a history of melanoma, which was stage 2B, uh, diagnosed two years prior to this presentation. So we got some imaging, and you can see uh, there were multiple metastases in the brain, more than 15. The largest was 2.1 centimeters, and there was some vasogenic edema around some of those lesions. He also had disease in multiple other organs. Um, everything else other than the left facial twitching was asymptomatic. So we biopsied one of the subcutaneous nodules. It showed metastatic melanoma. We sent it for BRAF, and it turns out that he had the BRAF V600E mutation present. Okay, so here are the options. And I uh, want all of my students to succeed, so I want to just start by saying there are no wrong answers here. This is not a test question. This is more of a survey, uh, because all these options can be chosen in the appropriate setting. So I want you to raise your hands uh, without any fear and uh, let me know if you would do one of these. So I'm gonna just say those out. First is whole brain radiation therapy. Any takers? Two, three, four maybe. Gamma knife. Nobody. PD-1 monotherapy. Epilimumab plus nivolumab combination. Maybe six or seven people. BRAF plus MEC, five, six over there. Hospice, couple, okay, okay. Mostly optimistic group, uh, <laughs> but you know, hospice in the right setting is uh, uh, not inappropriate in a terminal cancer. Okay, so for melanoma, as you know, there has been a therapeutic revolution. Since 2011, there have been so many different drugs that have been approved. On the left-hand side, you can see a list of immunotherapy drugs, PD-1 drugs, anti-CTLA-4 inhibitors, and then the combination of PD-1 plus CTLA-4. Intralesional TVEC uh, was uh, recently approved uh, three, four years back. Um, and on the chemotherapy side, uh, the targeted chemotherapy, I should say, uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, development in the BRAF and MEK inhibition. Um, there are several BRAF inhibitors and several MEK inhibitors and their combinations that have been approved. So I'll just start with a quick overview of uh, uh, the immunotherapies and targeted therapies. Uh, you should know these drugs, uh, the mechanism of actions and the various toxicities by now. Uh, but just to summarize, for immunotherapy, we have the option of uh, epilimumab. We have the option of PD-1 monotherapy, either nivolumab or pembrolizumab. Or we can do combination immunotherapy with epi plus nevo. And this uh, uh, Checkmate 67 trial compared all three of those options head to head. And uh, what we found out in this trial and others is that PD-1 monotherapy works better as compared to epilimumab. It works twice uh, as um, uh, more effective, uh, at least twice as more effective. And it is less toxic also, as you can see on, uh, by the rate of toxicities on the right-hand column here. Uh, if we combine IP plus NEVO, we get an even higher response rate, uh, but that comes at the cost of uh, greater toxicities, uh, so substantially increased toxicity with uh, IP plus NEVO, 55% uh, rate of grade 3 or higher as compared to 16% with nivolumab in this trial. Why do we use immunotherapy? Because of uh, a curves like this where you can see long-term survivorship in a proportion of patients. So this is uh, some early data. It's a few years old. Uh, we need more updates on these patients. Um, Five-year overall survival with PD-1 monotherapy in early phase trials of PD-1 was close to one-third of the patients were alive at five years, which was truly remarkable at that time. 
And uh, these are the waterfall plots uh, with uh, uh, Epi and Pembro. And as you can see, uh, these drugs can work in a substantial uh, proportion of patients, but they don't work in all the patients. As you can see here, a lot of patients still have the tumors progressing, uh, but vast majority have regressions. And once the tumors are regressing, generally that sets us up for uh, success down the line. Uh, but I think the take-home message is immunotherapy does not work all the time, and we need other options as well. So we also know that uh, there are certain mutations that are linked with, uh, associated with melanoma, mostly the MAP kinase pathway. You can have RAS mutations. You can have BRAF mutations. Specifically, 60% uh, of the patients have mutations in BRAF V600. Um, and uh, MEC is downstream, so inhibition of BRAF or MEC or both uh, can uh, uh, suppress the MAP kinase pathway and lead to activity. And indeed, that has panned out. There are multiple agents that have been approved. Vemurafenib, Debrafenib, Ancorafenib are all BRAF inhibitors. Trimetinib, Cobimetinib, and Binimetinib are MEK inhibitors. And uh, uh, some of the advantages of using BRAF uh, uh, with or without MEK are that we see tumor regressions in the vast majority of patients. So compared to the PD-1 curve, where the inflection point was somewhere over here, uh, close to 95% of patients are having tumor regressions. So these drugs are very, very reliable. If you want some tumor regression you can, in, in, the, in the BRAF mutant patients, you can pretty reliably get that. Very few patients, less than 5%, have uh, primary or intrinsic resistance to uh, BRAF MEK inhibitors. And also, uh, these regressions are very rapid. As you can see, uh, the PET scan improves dramatically by day 15. Many patients who have subcutaneous nodules in our clinic, when they start taking these drugs, their symptoms go away, the nodules start regressing within a few days. So if you want a reliable and rapid regression, BRAF MEK inhibition is uh, the way to go. Um, and then many trials have shown that BRAF and MEK combination is better than either drug given alone. And uh, unlike other combinations, this combination does not necessarily come with increased toxicity. It actually improves outcomes, progression-free survival, overall survival, response rates, and the toxicity does not seem to be substantially worse. So BRAF and MEK combo is considered the standard of care if you're using BRAF MEC uh, uh, pathway inhibition. Uh, one of the uh, longstanding beliefs is that uh, these drugs do not work forever. They work very well initially, but then eventually resistance develops uh, through different mechanisms, um, and uh, the so called acquired resistance develops in the vast majority of patients. So, we have, when we have all these options, how do we choose amongst these options? And this is a slide that I've shown before to this audience. Um, we obviously, as oncologists, are trying to establish goals of care for our patients, and those goals can be different in different situations. If our goal is durable disease control, um, then we obviously want to match uh, the therapies that can help us achieve that. Um, in some situations where patients have a lot of symptoms, we want to stabilize the situation and lead to rapid palliation of symptoms. And in that case, we probably want a therapy which has a high chance of tumor regression uh, and also uh, uh, likely rapid regression rather than delayed. And obviously, quality of life is uh, very important as well. Uh, one thing that we don't have time to talk about is the cost effects, the so-called financial toxicity, uh, but that's also something that we need to keep in mind because all these agents are super expensive. Okay, so the first question that I'm going to handle uh, today is, uh, for frontline treatment of our BRAF mutant patients, should we be picking immunotherapy or should we be picking BRAF plus MEC inhibition? And uh, again, I think going back to the goals of care, if we want long-term survivorship, um, we, the data or the belief has so far been that immunotherapy can lead to durable responses. Um, and BRAF-MEC generally, uh, all patients would progress. 
So we have some data to counter uh, the effects of, uh, or the long-term effects of BRAF uh, MEK inhibition. Uh, and this is a study that was published, uh, that was presented at ASCO a few weeks back and uh, with a simultaneous publication in New England Journal of Medicine. And what this study is showing us is a five-year analysis of two different trials that used BRAF plus uh, MEK inhibition in BRAF mutant melanomas. I don't have time to talk about the baseline characteristics and so of all these patients, but I'm, I'm gonna give you the highlights uh, of the results. So the, the big uh, uh, message from this uh, paper is that BRAF plus MEK inhibition can lead to long-term disease control in a small proportion of patients. So this is a progression-free survival uh, slide, and you can see at five years, close to 20% of the patients are progression-free. So our, our belief that, oh, everybody's gonna progress on BRAF, MEK eventually is not true. 20% of the patients can have long-term progression-free survival. Uh, this does translate into overall survival uh, uh, as well. So I showed you some early data from PD-1 uh, monotherapy where one-third of the patients were alive at five years, and uh, similar data was seen in uh, this study. Uh, this is the response data. 68% of the patients had objective responses, and 20% uh, of the patients had complete responses too. Um, and we talk about complete responses with immunotherapy, so that can happen with BRF MEK inhibition as well. And this is the outcomes by response. So as you can see, if you have a complete response, uh, the progression-free survival at five years is actually much better uh, as compared to the overall population. 50% of these patients have, do not progress. Now, the other way of looking at that is that even though these patients have a complete response, 50% of them have progressed eventually. So we are not really curing these patients. We are just suppressing their disease. Um, so, but this data still looks uh, quite remarkable. And overall survival by response is shown here. Uh, again, with complete responses, 71% of those patients are alive at five years. Again, truly remarkable. So one thing I think we have to keep in mind is how does this distinguish from what we have seen with immunotherapy? Um, so we have to keep in mind that these patients, the vast majority of these long-term um, uh, responders, they actually continue to receive therapy. So if you look at the, if you read the paper carefully, 88% of these patients were receiving the dabrafenib or trametinib or both um, at uh, the time of reporting this data. So only 12% had stopped. And one of the questions is what happens when these patients stop therapy? Are they gonna progress or are they gonna stay in remission? and which is gonna answer the biological question that can BRAF MEK inhibition eliminate the disease altogether leading to cure or is it just suppressing it um, and we need chronic suppressive therapy for these patients. And that is important when we think about the effects of uh, uh, these drugs on quality of life. These drugs are not easy to take. Uh, they're, you know, if you look at the rate of grade three, four side effects, it's close to 60%. The vast majority of patients are actually needing dose reductions, and uh, we can manage, we can find the right dose for each patient, and we can kind of help them through it, but it's, they're still taking it, they are still suffering to some degree from those uh, uh, side effects, um, and uh, this is very different, again, from immunotherapy, where your responses can be maintained even after you have completely come off immunotherapy and for many years after discontinuation. How does the long-term data from immunotherapy look? Uh, so this is uh, uh, the Checkmate 067 trial that I mentioned previously, and uh, the four-year follow-up from that was uh, presented at ESMO last year, and it was published in Lancet Ecology. And uh, you can see here the top curve is the NEVO plus IPI combination, and that's what I'm gonna focus on. Uh, so for, at four years, close to 40, 50% of these patients are still progression-free which is actually very remarkable. It looks better than uh, the BRAF MEK when we look at it. BRAF MEK had around 19% of patients progression-free at five years. If you look at the IPI-NEVO here, it's more close to 40, 
And uh, this is the overall survival. Uh, overall survival, uh, again, 60, close to 50, 60 percent of patients are alive at uh, five years or beyond. Uh, again, very remarkable. And this is probably the major distinguishing feature between the two drugs, the so-called treatment-free interval. So if you look at uh, the Ipinevo uh, uh, diagram here at the bottom, you see that the blue color re represents the patients who are f not receiving any treatment um, at, at the time of this follow-up. So 71% of patients are not on treatment. So you have to compare this to 88% of patients on BRAF MEC who are needing to stay on treatment. And this shows the median treatment-free interval after the patients came off treatment. And again, looks really good uh, with immunotherapy. So when we put these data side by side, uh, again, an illegal comparison, but uh, still, uh, we have to do that uh, because uh, there's no randomized trial data to guide us. Um, and uh, um, if you look at the overall response rates, 68% more in favor of the BRAF MAC by a little bit. Uh, complete responses, um, again, uh, quite uh, comparable. 20% of the patients are becoming complete responders. Uh, but here's the distinguishing feature. Four-year progression-free survival was 21% with BRAF MAC, 37% with Epinevo. Four-year overall survival was 37% with BRAF MAC and 62% with Epinevo. Uh, but uh, again, the major distinguishing feature was the vast majority of patients were still getting treatment on BRAF MAC and very few on Epinevo. So I'll let you choose one over the other. I'm not going to make a recommendation, but I think this is what the data is. So what's going on in the immunotherapy world? Um, uh, we had data presented uh, trying a novel dose uh, regimen of Epinevo, trying to retain the benefits but trying to improve the toxicity profile. So this is the 511 trial. And what they did was uh, compare the FDA-approved uh, regimen of Nevo uh, at, I'm sorry, the FDA-approved regimen of uh, Nevo 1 and Epi 3 milligram per kilogram uh, for the first four doses and followed by maintenance. And they compared it to the Nevo at three milligrams and Epi at the reduced dose of one. So Epi 1 versus Epi 3 in combination with Nevo. And the overall response rate was slightly uh, higher, not significant, for uh, the uh, Epi 3 arm. If you look at the waterfall plot, there's no real substantial difference. And if you look at the progression-free survival and overall survival curves, they are virtually overlapping with each other. So not much to choose from in terms of efficacy. Uh, but toxicity-wise, uh, the NEVO uh, 3 EPI-1 was uh, associated with grade 3 or higher immune-related adverse events at around uh, 33%. And it was much higher for EPI-3 NEVO-1. So by using a reduced dose of EPI, perhaps you can retain the efficacy uh, of the combination without uh, and possibly lower toxicity. So when we are talking about PD-1 monotherapy versus combination immunotherapy in the clinic, we, you know, we use numbers for toxicity of 20% or so with PD-1 and 60% with uh, EPI-3 NEVO-1. And uh, this regimen probably is a cross between the two. The toxicity rate is probably going to be closer to 30 to 40 percent, uh, and hopefully retaining the efficacy of uh, uh, the FDA-approved combination. So the other major update that is happening is in uh, brain metastases. And this is very relevant to the case that I presented. So as you know, patients have done uh, uh, very poorly historically with, uh, uh, when, once they develop uh, brain metastases. Uh, this is the overall survival data. The vast majority of patients pass away within the first year. Uh, the median overall survival in some series was as little as uh, three, four months. Um, and so definitely an area of unmet need. And traditionally what we have been doing is uh, once a patient presents with brain metastases, we send them to 
neurosurgery or radiation oncology. And depending on the number of metastases, if they are widespread metastases, radiation oncologists will have a knee-jerk response of uh, going to whole brain radiation. And uh, for limited number of metastases, gamma knife can be considered. Uh, but uh, and, and the number of metastases that they can treat with gamma knife seems to be increasing all the time. Um, uh, but that's, that's our default workflow. Send them to radiation oncology, let them get whatever the radiation oncology does, and then they come back and uh, talk about systemic therapy. And I think that needs to change now. When you have multiple brain metastases, it's a systemic problem. We have agents, as you will see, which can work inside the brain, and I think those need to be prioritized over radiation. And we need to match our radiation smartly um, um, in, in the care of these patients. So the first trial I'm gonna show here is using uh, nivolumab plus epilimumab in patients with brain metastases, untreated brain metastases, um, both asymptomatic as well as symptomatic. And these two cohorts deserve uh, uh, special attention separately. So they use the standard FDA-approved dose of uh, ep 3 and Nevo-1. And uh, these are the results, and uh, we really want to focus on the intracranial responses here. So overall response rate in patients with asymptomatic metastases, I actually should go back and uh, just define uh, what the population was. So patients could have more than one measurable but unradiated uh, metastases, which had to be between the size of five millimeters and three centimeters. Um, you could have prior stereotactic radiation therapy to less than three brain metastases. You could have prior treatment with BRAF, MEC, but no prior immunotherapy. So in this population, first use of immunotherapy led to a very high intracranial response rate, 54%, which actually mirrors what was seen extracranially. So I, th I think the responses are very concordant. If the immunotherapy is working extracranially, it has a very good chance of working intracranially as well. And you also want to see there were complete responses in close to 30% of the patients, which is, again, uh, quite remarkable. And this is the waterfall plot. Looks really good. I think it will beat any day uh, the effects of uh, whole brain radiation therapy um, in this population. And uh, uh, also, you know, stereotactic uh, uh, radiation. Most patients would have new metastases, even if they are responding well to the radiated areas. Uh, Progression-free survival data looks pre pretty good. Overall survival in asymptomatic uh, patients looks really good. And this is kind of the summary. Overall response rates more than 50%. Estimated six-month progression-free survival more than 60%. Median overall survival has not yet been reached. Now, in symptomatic patients, and uh, this was also a very uh, strictly defined cohort, patients could have some symptoms and uh, they could have had some steroids, but not a heavy dose of steroids. This was four milligrams or less, which is you know, a tiny dose of steroids uh, as compared to what we use uh, typically for uh, patients with big uh, metastases. So again, uh, they saw intracranial responses, but the uh, number is much lower, 20% or so as compared to 50, 60%. Uh, so the efficacy seems to be compromised in these patients. Uh, they saw four patients who had partial uh, or complete responses, and these are the characteristics. Uh, three of them were not using steroids at baseline. And again, progression-free survival, there is a possibility of long-term survivorship, but it does not happen as commonly as we want it. And this is kind of just the summary slide uh, for that. So the conclusions for the brain metastases uh, uh, part is that we can see durable intracranial responses in patients with asymptomatic brain metastases, and that supports the use of Nevo plus Ipi as first-line therapy in these patients. Symptomatic patients remain difficult to treat, but some of them can benefit from Nevo and Ipi combination. Uh, this, uh, just want to remind of the data that was presented a couple of years back. This is using BRAF and MEC combination in patients with met met brain metastases who also had the BRAF mutation. Um, and uh, they had different cohorts. Cohort D was symptomatic cohort, but uh, what you can see is all these cohorts, the BRAF MEC again, this is all intracranial responses by the way, again the BRAF MEC is working really well in the brain initially. 
so these drugs can penetrate past the blood-brain barrier, or their effects can penetrate past the blood-brain barrier. So if you, you, whatever you expect systemically, you can expect intracranially. Um, the progression-free survival is not as good as what you would see with immunotherapy. Most of these patients are responding initially, but then they progress quite rapidly. And if you look at the median progression-free survival, it's actually much lower than what you expect from these drugs extracranially. So these drugs work well initially, and again, the benefits do not last. Um, and this is what is summarized here. And uh, so we, yeah, I may not have that much time, but let's go back to the case and see if it, this data changes our practice patterns. So again, just a reminder, 51-year-old man had left facial twitching, multiple brain metastases, disease elsewhere, which was asymptomatic, uh, and BRAF mutation was present. How many takers for whole brain now? One, okay. Uh, stereotact, are you a radiation oncologist, by the way? <laughs> no, okay. Stereotactic radio surgery for more than 15 brain metastases? No. PD-1 monotherapy? IP-3 plus Nevo-1? One, two, okay. BRAF plus MEC? Okay. Close to 10, 15. So I think that, that's where I see the switch. A lot of people have moved from Epi Nevo to BRAF MEC. Hospice still? Okay, great. <laughs> My job is done. So uh, uh, this is, you know, I, I treated this patient uh, and I was faced with the same decision making. And so he had young guy, asymptomatic, great performance status a little bit of facial twitching and multiple disease, multiple lesions in the brain, and some of them are on the bigger side, and they could create trouble. Um, so the way I think about it is, yes, epinevo can actually lead to long-term survivorship, uh, but there's also you know, close to a 50% chance of it not working, and do I wanna flip a coin right now and make that decision for the patient and then you know, turn out on the other side? Uh, uh, and that led me to use something that is more reliable, at least initially. So I use BRAF MEC, um, and I know that it has a very good chance of working in the short term. Uh, we started him on it. He tolerated it really well. Six weeks, we got a brain MRI just to make sure that things are moving well. His subcutaneous nodules had also melted at that time. Most of his brain metastases had shrunk substantially. And that's when I was again faced with the decision, should I continue doing what I'm doing? And I know the data doesn't look good. BRAF MEC responses are not gonna be lasting for a very long time. Um, uh, and I felt like now the situation is a bit more stable than it was six weeks back. And uh, at that time, I tried to transition him proactively to IP3 NEVO1. Um, and that's what he's getting right now. It also turns out as soon as he stopped BRAF MEC, these tumors probably started growing again and his twitching returned. So I actually had to restart the BRAF MEC while we are waiting for a response from IP NEVO. Um, and so he's, he's actually, and, and yeah, we, we can talk about that, four drugs um, which can all be potentially toxic, but you know, we didn't have a choice. And uh, he's doing well, he's stable, he's tolerating well. He has some hypophysitis right now, which is probably good. He's having some immune activation and I'm hoping that we can salvage him. So maybe I'll stop right there. I have uh, several other slides about adjuvant therapy, but we don't have time to go over it and we can chat offline. Thank you so much for your attention. Any questions for Dr. Wati? That, that's a great question. So, you know, that's, that's been uh, uh, one of the questions about sequencing. You know, are we uh, potentially compromising responses to the subsequent therapy that is going to be used? We don't have a definite answer on that. There, there's actually, you can argue either way. 
BRAF MEC has been shown to uh, promote T cell inflammation in the tumors at least early on, which would argue for more early uh, switching proactively. Uh, but it can also uh, yes, lead to some counter-regulatory immune responses, which can potentially compromise the response to immunotherapy. So the other argument that we've heard also is that, it's, that immunotherapy works better when there is smaller volume of disease. So downstaging with BRAF MEC and then moving to immunotherapy, is that a rational choice? Uh, that's, yeah, that's exactly what we are trying to do here, you know, stabilizing the situation or you know, re removing the bulk, so to speak, and maybe immunotherapy will have a better chance of working in that, that situation. Uh, but the other, uh, other thing I did not mention was if you look at those long-term responders with BRAF MEC, they also tend to be the ones not with the high LDH or multiple mutations, uh, multiple tumors. Uh, they tend to be with normal LDH, less than three organ sites involved, and they, those are the patients. So it's people who have better prognosis to begin with. They also tend to respond better to the therapies. Um, and uh, that makes it hard to choose between the two in that subgroup because both of those therapies can work really well. Uh, but the way I think about it is um, in a good situation where you're not running against time, if you have a small subcutaneous metastases, uh, you can try immunotherapy without compromising the safety of the patient and hopefully get a long-term response. If you don't, if the immunotherapy doesn't work, then you can always come in with BRAF MEC. And uh, uh, if you don't have any other options, the long-term follow-up data suggests that maybe you can get long-term survivorship in at least some of those patients.